Brain health has been very popular in the news lately, and this podcast is for you if you've ever had brain fog, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, CTE, any of these issues, this is the podcast where we're going to jump into the latest research from Dr. Dale Bredesen, Dr. Daniel Amen, Dave Asprey of the Bulletproof Diet, so many other people, all the minds that are really out there paving the way, blazing a path for new research new strategies that are actually working to get your brain optimized and working at its highest, highest level. The Brain Builders Podcast is just for you. So get a notebook, get a pen, and get ready to open up your mind and get back to the person that you were meant to be. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Brain Builders Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. John DeWitt. And today we're back into Dave Asprey's book, Headstrong, The Bulletproof Plan to Activate Untapped Brain Energy to Work Smarter and Think Faster in Just Two Weeks. And I have to admit I have uh, read ahead, and once we get to the Headstrong program itself, it's pretty exciting, pretty amazing, a lot of uh, meal choices, and uh, it's going to be really exciting. But but first, we're going to go more into the lovely toxins that are in our foods today. Organophosphates. Organophosphates are also terribly destructive to your mitochondria. They alter all five mitochondrial complexes, disrupt the mitochondrial membrane, reduce ATP production, mess with antioxidant cellular defenses, and promote cell death. Not good. How can you avoid GMO produce? Well, your best bet is to buy organic at the grocery store or get to know a local farmer and buy directly for him, from him or her. You can also go online and learn more about which fruits and vegetables are never GMO, like one of my favorites, avocado, and they are so good. Got to make sure they're right, though. Not too right. Uh, does it take a little more work and money to seek out non-GMO produce? Sometimes it does. But keep in mind that every time you eat a GMO food, you're being exposed to a small dose of organophosphate. Dave says he thinks it's worth the time and investment not to expose your mitochondria to poison every day. You think? Mercury. Mercury is a heavy metal and one of the most toxic of all in its class. It depletes the antioxidants in your mitochondria need that your mitochondria need to combat oxidative stress leading to inflammation, cell damage, and mitochondrial dysfunction. It has also been directly linked to reduced IQ. Thanks to water pollution, mercury is commonly found in our seafood. Mercury accumulates in the tissues of fish, so the higher a fish is on on the food chain, the more likely it is to contain dangerous levels of mercury. The highest concentrations of mercury are found in tile fish, swordfish, shark, and mackerel. You will avoid these fish on the Headstrong program. There is some evidence that seafood contains selenium, which can help to counteract the mercury in seafood, but it's still a better bet to avoid the most mercury-tainted species. I'm sorry to say the next on the list is sugar. Yes, Dave considers sugar at commonly consumed levels to be a neurotoxin. It is part of a nearly... It is part of nearly every major degenerative illness, including and especially Alzheimer's disease, so much so that many doctors have begun referring to Alzheimer's disease as type 3 diabetes. Scientists have known that sugar is bad for the brain since 1927, when a biochemist named Herbert Crabtree discovered that elevated glucose levels lower mitochondrial function. This is called the Crabtree effect. To this day, we are constantly learning more about exactly what sugar does to our brains. A 2013 article in the New England Journal of Medicine stated that in diabetic patients, even mild elevations in blood sugar were strongly related to the development of Alzheimer's disease. Insulin resistance is also linked to Alzheimer's, something that Dr. Dale Bredesen talks about in his book, The End of Alzheimer's. Insulin resistance, sometimes referred to as prediabetes, is a condition in which the body becomes less sensitive to the presence of the hormone insulin. As you might know, the pancreas produces insulin to help metabolize sugar. When too much sugar is present in the blood, the result of consuming a lot of sugar, too much insulin is produced in response. 
Over time, this onslaught of insulin desensitizes the body to smaller amounts of insulin. So your pancreas will continue to churn out insulin in huge, huge amounts even when you eat a small quantity of sugar. What does this have to do with your brain? Insulin helps facilitate communication between your neurons. When you're insulin resistant, the excess insulin rushes to your brain and important messages get lost in the flood. A 2015 study showed that people who were insulin resistant but who did not have Alzheimer's disease or diabetes scored lower on memory tests than those who were not insulin resistant. In another study conducted that same year at UCLA, rats that were fed a high sugar diet for six weeks experienced declines in their ability to navigate through a maze and exhibited less synaptic activity than rats that weren't fed sugar. Their neurons literally couldn't signal to each other and the rats lost their ability to think clearly or complete tasks they'd learned just six weeks earlier. In humans, sugar has been shown to make us moody and angry by messing with our neurotransmitters and decreasing the number of dopamine receptors in our brains. This makes it harder to feel the effects of dopamine and creates dopamine resistance, which is the same neurological response that is, is observed in drug addicts. Sugar is, a, is as powerful as a drug when it comes to its effects on our brains. But as we covered earlier, perhaps the greatest havoc sugar wreaks on the brain is in the form of inflammation. When you have high levels of blood sugar and insulin, your body releases inflammatory cytokines. This can create a vicious cycle as insulin causes inflammation and inflammation causes more severe insulin resistance. Blood sugar levels then creep higher and higher as you become increasingly inflamed, foggy, forgetful, and tired. All forms of sugar are bad for your brain, but fructose found in fruit, high, fru high fructose corn syrup, and agave nectar is the worst. Fructose creates oxidative stress and feeds the bad bacteria in your gut, leading to even more inflammation. Fructose is implicated in damaging mitochondria in skeletal muscle cells, harming the mitochondrial membrane and impairing cellular respiration and energy metabolism. While your brain won't suffer too much if you eat moderate amounts of whole seasonal fruit, you should avoid consuming excessive amounts of fructose and completely stay away from fruit juice and foods that contain high fructose corn syrup and agave nectar. Dave recommends no more than about 20 grams of fructose a day from any source for maximum cognitive function. Alcohol. In addition to all the other ways that alcohol is bad for your brain, it causes oxidative stress in your mitochondria while simultaneously reducing your mitochondria's oxidative stress defenses. This is like making the good guys weaker so they can't fight off the bad guys while adding more bad guys at the same time. It leads to a vicious cycle of more and more cell damage. This added oxidative stress also makes your cells more susceptible to apoptosis or death. Basically, alcohol slows down the energy production in your cells, weakens them, and then makes them more likely to die. Sure, having a beer or two with your family and friends is fun, but there are other ways to have fun without literally killing your brain cells. Keep in mind that many flavored alcohols and mixers contain high fructose corn syrup, which is bad for your mitochondria even without the alcohol. And beer and wine are unfiltered and undistilled, so all of the fermentation byproducts are still present. This includes mold toxins such as OTA. On the Headstrong program, Dave recommends that you abstain from alcohol completely for two weeks. After that, choose distilled clear spirits, not beer, or if you tolerate it, low toxin wine from the vendors listed at Bulletproof EXEC or BulletproofExec.com slash wine. You can take some vitamin C and glutathione supplements when you have alcohol, to help your mitochondria survive a few drinks. Is coconut oil all it's cracked up to be? Like butter, coconut oil once had a bad reputation due to its extraordinarily high concentration of saturated fat. Fortunately, we now know that there's no association between coconut oil and heart disease. Dave likes coconut oil because it is a widely available, good saturated fat that is relatively stable at high temperatures, which means it's great for cooking and it tastes good in some recipes. More recently, coconut oil has earned a reputation for being a brain-boosting fat source. So which is it, junk food or superfood? The truth, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Coconut oil naturally contains 11 different types of fat, each of which does something different in your body. 
only four of those types of fats are categorized as medium chain triglycerides, each with very different metabolic effects. The most common and cheapest of these is lauric acid, L-A-U-R-I-C is how you spell that, a fat that is technically classified as an MCT because the chemist decided that long before we knew how the body used it. The problem is that your body processes lauric acid as if it were a long-chain fatty acid. Now remember, the shorter the fat, the better. Thus, it does not raise ketone like other true biological MCTs, and there's a strong case that lauric acid should no longer be classified as an MCT. Coconut oil is about 50% lauric acid. That's a little scary because a recent study found that lauric acid can cause immune, immune T cells to create more inflammation and, in mice, make the neurodegenerative disease, MS, worse. This is not a call to stop eating coconut oil, but it means you should use it in moderation, two to three tablespoons per day, and eat it with vegetables. You should never add extra lauric acid to your diet on purpose, even when it's marked, marketed as an MCT oil. The remaining three types of MCTs in coconut oil are caproic acid, caprylic acid, and capric acid. Caproic acid is present in small amounts in coconut oil. It tastes bad and it often causes stomach upset, but it does raise ketones. If you use generic MCT oil that is not triple distilled, you may get traces of this oil and feel it as a burning in your throat and disaster pants later. Caprylic acid is the rarest MCT in coconut oil, 4 to 6% of its fat. It has potent antimicrobial properties to help you have a healthy gut and provides the most ketones for your brain of any other oil. Capric acid makes up about 9% of the fat in coconut oil. It takes slightly longer for it to turn into energy for your brain, and your ketones do not rise as high, but it is more affordable and widely available than caprylic acid. Each of the MCTs in coconut oil can be distilled to create separate oils, either bottled individually or as blends. Some of these generic MCT oils do raise ketones more quickly than coconut oil itself. The problem with many of these oils, however, is that low-cost distillation methods may allow traces of caprylic acid to remain, so you get disaster pants. Another big issue with generic MCT oils is that, like coconut oil, they can contain a high percentage of lauric acid, which is associated with inflammation. This dilutes the power of the other MCTs in the oil makes it, and makes it less effective at raising ketones. The least ethical companies actually try to sell this as a benefit to unwitting consumers. They've created two oils to solve this problem. Brain octane oil, which I use and love, introduced in chat earlier, and XCT oil. Both oils are triple distilled in the United States on food-grade machinery using only coconut oil as the source with no solvents ever. Generic MCT oil is often made overseas with single distillation of solvent extracted palm oil, which results in more oil impurities and palm oil, oil usage kills orangutans, orangutans and destroys rainforests. <laughs> XCT oil is distilled to be about six times stronger than coconut oil and is a more affordable mix of cap capric and caprylic acids. It does not raise ketones as much as brain octane oil, and there's limit to how much you can have before it causes gastric distress. But XCT oil supports the gut biome and helps lower inflammation, which can reduce cravings and brain fog. Brain octane oil made of carefully filtered caprylic acid is the single most powerful form of MCT and raises your ketones the highest and the fastest, far beyond any other fat found in coconut oil or any other food. Caprylic acid comprises 5 to 6% of the fats found in coconut oil, so you'd have to eat more than a dozen tablespoons of coconut oil to get the amount of caprylic acid in just one tablespoon of brain octane oil. It requires the most coconut oil to manufacture, but is far more potent than XCT oil, generic MCT oil, or coconut oil, and most people can have a lot more of it without the digestive problems of generic MCT oil. And we will talk more about that next time. Thanks for listening to the Brain Builders podcast. I'm your host, Dr. John DeWitt, and I hope you enjoyed this information. And as I said, we're going to talk more about acrylic acid, brain octane oil, and all fun stuff like that next time on the podcast. Have a great day.